This is The Strange Recital, a podcast about fiction which questions the nature of reality. I'm Herman Haber. Perhaps you've heard of my father. He won the Nobel Prize. This is our kitchen in Berlin on an evening in May of 1915. It's the height of the Great War, the First World War, the war to end all wars. And these are the last moments of my parents' life together. Ah, the fruit of the vine and spice of the juniper berry, the strength of sour cabbage and the sweetness of the onion. This is chemistry. It is sublime. So, Fritz, how was it? Good. This work you did for the fatherland. I can't really... Tell me what it was. There is something I heard, something you might like. How is a German man like an onion? He stinks, has many layers, and if he's potent, he will make you cry. You think this is funny? I'm not sure. Some people laughed. It's just something I heard. Well, here's something I heard. Of all languages, German most resembles what an infant feels in the womb. Barks, bursts, the tones that spark fear. Clara, dear, what's the matter? Stop what it is you're doing. Stop it now. It's an honor. It's a horror. You don't know. Yes, yes, I do. I know you. I know this. I can see. Oh. I'm sorry. Herman, my sweet boy, you must be tired from your studies. Come, have some of your mother's choucroute. Smells like heaven, doesn't it? I just want a piece of bread. Well, then you'll have it. Feed the brain. Do your work. Herman, of your parents, which would you say is the greater scientist? That is not a question to ask a boy. Yes, it is. And the answer would be your father. To the extent that science is the pursuit of discovery, but I am the better technician, the better analyst. Without me, he is lost. This is true. Uh, Would you like... uh... Thanks. Mm. You must know, Herman, that this man, your father, this Jewish boy from Breslau, I met him when he was just your age, buttering his bread, busy with studies... And then he accomplished the single greatest scientific achievement of all time. I know, Mother. You don't know. Even he does not know. Twenty million lives would have been lost if not for him. Oh, please, my dear. I'm so tired. And I can't... The world could not feed its people. Manure, guano, seaweed. They were fertilizers, yes, but not enough. Never enough for the farmers to grow the wheat for the daily bread. We all would have starved without the fertilizer he created from thin air, literally. Please. Listen, Herman, listen to me. Mama, I I can't. But you must. Listen. The air you breathe is mostly nitrogen. Four out of five molecules, 80% of our atmosphere, it's nitrogen. And everything alive needs nitrogen. But how do we take it from the air and put it in the ground? I I don't know. Nobody did. Nobody could figure it out. It was impossible, like alchemy. But your father pumped nitrogen into an iron tank, added hydrogen and pressure to separate the atoms and make fertilizer from air. The Haber process. This is the Genius of your father. Stop. Saved your life, all our lives, millions and millions of lives. May I please be excused? Yes, my dear boy, you may go. Fritz, do you know what I did while you were in Belgium? Guess. I'm asking you to guess. Cooked? Tended your garden, took care of... Calculations. What? Projections. I don't understand. No, you don't. You are the stupidest smart person I've ever seen. You think you know all the numbers. 
but only I know the number of lives that will be lived in the future thanks to you. There will come a time, a mere century from now, when half the nitrogen atoms in every human body on Earth will come from your process. Every person in the world will owe his life to the food you gave them. You can't know. I can, and I do, because I did the math. You're upset. You'll win the Nobel Prize when I submit these figures in a year, two at most. I'm not sure. I am, absolutely. Now, tell me what you did in Belgium. What was it? Fritz, as your partner, as your lover, I have a right to know. At the front, the Belgian front, I supervised the placement of 6,000 canisters of chlorine gas made in my lab at the war office. I decided when the wind was right. I gave the order to open the valves and release 150 tons of gas, a cloud of green fog that drifted. My dear God! And leaves of plants shriveled, birds fell from the sky, and our enemies, unaware unprepared, drowned in their own mucus. Thousands upon thousands of enemy soldiers gone, dead, just like that. So, as you see, I've been decorated. I do see. I will end this awful war, Clara, this war of attrition. I will stop this misery for our young men, wallowing in mud, filth, and disease, I will bring victory to the fatherland. Oh, and what sort of father do you think you are? A good one. Who kills thousands of innocent sons just like that? This is war. This is barbaric. They are enemies. They are boys, just like yours, just like you. And you celebrate? You celebrate cowardice. I celebrate victory. Fritz, you have no idea. I have all the ideas. Papa? Mama? May I have a plate? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yes, of course. For your studies. Yes. To grow strong. Thanks. Son, please know... Clara. I am the better chemist. The first German woman ever to earn a doctorate in... Shut up, Fritz. Never forget this, my boy. Taste what you're tasting now and think. Your father would not have the patience to soak the sour cabbage in Riesling or soften the onions without scorching them to release their sweetness. This takes time and love and care. This he would never do. This he does not understand. And this is what is sacred about life, sweetness, and love. Your studies now. On what subject do they focus? History. Ah, so tricky. Only the winners tell stories, which is why we must be sure to win. Clara, what are you doing? That's my gun. Don't point it at me. Promise to stop. Oh, my dear. Stop now, Fritz, and be a father. I am a military consultant. You can't keep doing this. Shoot me if you think I'm wrong. You yourself did the numbers. If you think I've killed more people than I've saved, take my life. You're a monster! If you kill me, you will please our enemy, and then you'll be shot. I will not be married to a man who thinks as you do. Oh, Clara, my little cabbage. I will not! I will not! I will not! So much emotion. (sighs) Mama, Mama, Mama. What? She's gone, Papa. Dead. She made a choice, then. No, 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 no. Herman, you should know. I must return to war. 
Don't. On my honor. It's all I have. So, that is what he'll do. Though he'll fail to save his precious fatherland, even with his marvels of science. And he will continue to create poisons, including another gas called Zyklon, which the Nazi party will use to kill what's left of his family. No. And then he will die in exile. No. And in disgrace. I will not. But I will escape and go to America. And when I'm safely there, I will shoot myself in the heart with a pistol, as my dear mother did, haunted by who he was and what I am, the son of a brilliant, thoughtless man. That was Fretz by Rob Ackerman. The cast was Grace Foster as Herman, David Foster as Fritz, and Violet Snow as Clara. We'll be talking on the phone with Rob Ackerman right after this piece of music. Rob Ackerman, Esquire. Welcome to The Strange Recital. We're glad to have you here, even though you're not here. I think I'm even gladder than you. And thank you for your play, Fritz, which we've just aired. Well, your skills never cease to amaze me, Tom. I mean, I sang in a doo-wop group and a glee club and a choir when I was a kid, and I learned to love music and sound and, and overtones in churches. But I have always found technical stuff to be really daunting, and you're so good at it. Well, thank you. We've known each other a long time, over 20 years now, I think, as colleagues in the film business. And all that time, you've also been a playwright. Well, I started writing plays after the suicide of a dear friend when we were in our early 30s, before I met you, Tom. And theater has always been the love of my working life, from preschool and grade school in central Ohio to college in Middlebury, Vermont, to a stage directing degree at Northwestern University in Chicago. But uh, when my wife and I moved to New York, my time got swallowed up by the work I had to do to pay the bills, yeah. to, to have kids, which was wonderful. But I was also getting um, kind of sad inside. So when we lost this friend, I had a sort of premature midlife crisis and just stopped doing everything and started doing theater again. And I think it saved me. I mean, if I hadn't gone back to making plays, I really don't know what would have become of me. Well, I'm glad it saved you. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen only one of your plays performed on stage, and that was Tabletop. I loved it. A humorous look at the film business, focusing on one of those mom-and-pop production companies in the 80s with that tyrannical director. I saw it twice. The second time I took my son, so he could understand what I did at work. Now, of course, he's in the business himself and knows only too well. Oh, I love you and your son, and I admire your polymath capacities, Tom, as an author, musician, producer, performer, engineer, oh, and craftsman. Steady. You inspire me. Steady. And though I <laughs> you do, and though I have had the pleasure of working with your son, I can never hire him because he's always busy. Yep. No, as far as tabletop goes, it took me about nine years and 35 drafts oh my God. to get that play up and running. And I'm not exaggerating. I labored over every syllable as if it were poetry, which is what it sort of is, actually. Plays are more poetry than prose, and poems are basically music. Hmm. We should never read plays in the silence of a library. That's like asking someone to sit down and read the score of Beethoven's Seventh Symphony. It doesn't work. You have to hear it. Um, let's get back to talking about Fritz. Yes, please stop me before I digress again. I'll admit I'd never heard of Fritz Haber. In America, sometimes pronounced Haber. 
though I think I'll stick with Harbour. <laughs> I'd never heard of him until I read your play. So, you're a disseminator of knowledge, as well as a prop guy and a playwright. I really just write about what upsets me. I mean, plays are problems that have no answers. And in this case, a theater company called Core Artist Ensemble has been asking me to write a short play for them every year for the past few years. It's a very democratic and utopian group of actors, directors, and writers led by two women, both named Rachel, Rachel Lee and Rachel Kasparian. And last year's assignment was incredibly specific. The Rachels wanted us to write about an episode of Radio Lab, any episode, this science podcast that I, I do like to listen to. And it just so happened that I'd been haunted by this one episode about a man uh, who was the epitome of both good and evil. Yeah, it's such a tragic story. A brilliant man who saved so many lives with one invention and took so many with another. He makes the single greatest scientific discovery of all time, and then he creates the world's first weapon of mass destruction. Well, I'm not sure he saw that as a problem. He said that in peacetime, scientists should work globally, and in wartime, they should work for their own countries. He also said, death was death, no matter the cause. Since I read this play, I looked into him a bit. He was a German-Jewish chemist, but he identified more with his German nationality than with his Jewish religion. He even converted to Christianity, as did his first wife, Clara, and I think his second wife as well. Maybe that was a career move in those halcyon days. What do you think, Rob? All of his talk about the fatherland. Look, I... Two, I'm of German Jewish descent. My grandfather's family came from a town called Gemunden. But Jews can be anti Semitic, whether it's out of fear or self hatred, it gets ugly. Hmm. And I don't buy any excuses for this man and his nativism and his jingoism. Yeah. When you align yourself with a tribe instead of with all of humanity, you are in the wrong. And by all accounts, Robert E. Lee was a charming gentleman, but he was also the greatest American traitor of all time. If General Lee had accepted President Lincoln's invitation to oversee the Union Army, he could have prevented the slaughter of 750,000 Americans. Mm. In most tragedies, the hero's flaw is arrogance, and short-sightedness, and pride. And the, the Harvard story is no exception. Yeah. It's a double tragedy that Haber also created Zyklon, the gas the Nazis used against his people, including some of his family members. Yes, but I don't think he was personally responsible for that. Zyklon A was invented by scientists in the 1920s at the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute, of which he was the director, so I suppose you could assume he knew about it. I think the gas the Nazis used was Zyklon B. Yes, but Zyklon B is just a further evolved version of Zyklon A, and both exist because of Haber's leadership. He is the father of chemical warfare and killing gas. You, you, you can't explain that away or sugarcoat it. Poison is poison. The Haber-Bosch process, creating ammonia from hydrogen and nitrogen under high pressure, for which he won a Nobel Prize, is today feeding half the world's population through the fertilizers as is made possible. But he also did pioneering work in electrochemistry and in chemical thermodynamics, whatever that is. <laughs> and he's known as the father of chemical warfare because of the chlorine gas he created in World War I and for which he was awarded an Iron Cross. He even spent a lot of time trying to extract gold from seawater. You just can't get away from alchemy, can you? <laughs> Maybe not. We've been talking about Fritz so far, but his wife Clara, who has such a big role in your play is a tragic figure, too. I liked the way she could see into the future, into our times, through her calculations, at least as you depicted her in the play. So what else can you tell us about her? I, I love her. I really do. She's so calm and, and resolute. And in fact, she was the first German woman ever to earn a PhD in chemistry. I didn't feel like I wrote Clara. She sort of wrote herself. Um, that's, there's something about that quiet poise and strength that really gets to me. Uh, women listen better than men generally, and so they really ought to be ruling the world. Maybe her suicide was the result of Fritz's grim war work, or maybe it was due to underlying depression. Their son Hammond killed himself, as did his daughter. That suggests that genes might have been involved. Or epigenetics. 
emotional trauma passed down through families. Hmm. That's a slippery slope, don't you think? Epigenetics involves genes, doesn't it? Just no mutation of DNA. But you guys, this was not a pathology. Any sentient person whose life partner is blithely killing thousands of young men by making them choke on their own snot might be tempted to blow her brains out. The men who justify the mass murder, they, they are the ones who are mentally ill. So, Rob, there's one thing I've been wondering about. You've always seemed to me to be an optimistic, upbeat kind of guy. Tabletop was a humorous play. Maybe it was a social commentary too. But this play, Fritz, is a much darker tale. What led you to write it? Well, Tabletop, at least on certain nights, could get dark as hell. The kid who's at the center of that play gets metaphorically and almost literally killed. It's sort of true that only by going into the dark can we really appreciate the light? And when people ask me what kind of plays I write, my answer usually is I write about people trying and failing to work together. And that's both funny and sad. Yeah. If tabletop was a comedy, then Fritz is a tragedy. That word has come up quite a bit in this discussion. What exactly is tragedy? It sounds Greek to me. A dramatization of suffering that an audience can enjoy through catharsis, which is a purging of negative emotions. So it's good for your health. And you're right, it did come from ancient Greece and has uh, rippled outwards ever since. You could say that it sort of underpins Western civilization. What? You mean Western civilization is based on people enjoying watching other people suffer? I could go to town on this. Yes, I'm sure you could, but uh, we don't have time for that. I'm happy to sit here and listen all day. I am, really. (laughs) Well, Rob, what I draw from your play is the danger of technology without morality, where difficult questions can be avoided by justifying the means to an end. It's like deliberately being blind. It happens all the time, and has always happened. Albert Speer, Hitler's architect and later his munitions minister, was blind to the moral turpitude of using slave labour. It was only after spending a number of years in Spandau prison that he publicly acknowledged remorse. And what good was that, except to him? Uh, When my dad was a student at Princeton University, he actually stood up during a lecture by a professor named Albert Einstein and asked the man, this physicist, if he felt any guilt about the fact that his work was essential to the development of the atomic bomb. And Einstein's answer to my father was that he felt like a caring parent whose child had turned into a delinquent. He had done the best he could. But when you are aware that your actions are about leading directly to mass death, you have to take responsibility. I mean, that's what happens in Arthur Miller's masterful play, All My Sons, It's our duty to own up to the stuff that we do to one another so we don't keep doing it. The story also suggests the dangers of nationalism. Fritz saw himself as a patriot. Ultimately, he was spurned and despised by the country he loved, and then his conversion to Christianity didn't help, another layer to the tragedy. The message of this play is very pertinent today. This is a scary time. A hundred years ago, Warren Harding became our president by deploying the slogan, America First. And my next play takes us to that time and to the people of that time. The title is Loyalty, and that cuts two ways. That show is going to have three performances at a festival in New York this October in this theater in Chelsea called the Hudson Guild. Well, I shall look forward to seeing that and making it the second play of yours that I've seen. Anyway... We must wrap it up now. Thanks again, Rob. This is the first time we've had a play on The Strange Recital, and I'm happy it was one of yours. I'm deeply honored, and I just love what you guys are doing. I enjoy it all the time, every episode, so please keep doing it. Yes, thanks, Rob. And all you future Fritz Haubers who may be listening, if you're not off studying, beware. And be careful in every sense of the word. This is The Strange Recital. Our website is thestrangerecital.com. The music on this episode was from Scherzo No. 2, 
Opus 14 by Clara Schumann and from Fantasiestücke Opus 73 by Robert Schumann. I chose music by the two Schumanns because there are certain parallels which resonate with the play. Both couples were comprised of brilliant, tragic people. Both women shared the same name. Both women were perhaps stymied by the times they lived in. Clara Schumann was recognised as a great pianist in her day, but her talents as a composer were underappreciated. Clara Haber was the first woman in Germany to receive a PhD in chemistry, but was never able to go further with it. Depression was a factor in both families. In the case of the Schumanns, it was Robert who suffered. He also made a suicide attempt and died several years later in a mental institution. This is episode 18061. By 18062, I hope to have shaken this residual and annoying cold that you may have detected. 